do it officially. The Senate Tax Committee will come to order. We do have a quorum. Uh, first uh, thing on the agenda today, we're going to talk about estate taxes in the first uh, bill up that Senator Anderson, uh, SF-83, Senator Anderson. Uh, good morning, Mr. Chair and members. Thank you for allowing me the privilege to come before you with Senate File 83 uh, regarding the estate tax. And uh, I'm basically going to introduce this bill uh, as a, a repeal of the estate tax. And, and uh, I'm looking at just a, a summary that was done by a study by a Minnesota Revenue, uh, Minnesota State tax study March 5th of 2014 I have in my my hands here and it, the summary basically says the estate tax in its current form is complicated it uses two parallel calculations with two different tax rate tables from federal law as it existed 14 years ago and it includes in its calculation a unified credit at, at 2000 at the 2000 level it includes calculations for the phase out of the benefits of a progressive rate structure on the form rather than in a rate table. It places the highest marginal rate, tax rate of 41% on the smallest of states that pay tax. And the new gift tax is not part of the unified estate and gift tax system. And I see this tax as something that is very progressive and something that is much needed for uh, many uh, people here in the state uh, because of the fact that we're seeing businesses leave and uh, people departing from our state because of such a tax. May not be the biggest tax that we have that we face each year, but uh, I have lots of uh, concern and people that are, have talked to me about this. And I have some people here, here to testify and I'd just as soon have those come, people come forward and uh, address the, the uh, members. Uh, thank you, Senator Anderson. I just, just a thought, since we, we have a lot of, t we have several testifiers and they kind of overlap, I think. Um, would it be okay with you since your bill is so quick and short, you know, repeal. Uh, if we heard Senator Uyghurs and then brought the testifiers up, would that be okay? That would be great. Okay. Uh, so we'll hear Senator Uyghurs' uh, bill. So Senator Uyghur, you have Senate File 8, variation of the estate tax repeal. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair, committee members. Senate File 8 addresses the estate tax, but doesn't do a outright repeal. Uh, it addresses a single exclusion amount of $5 million, then a single tax rate of 16%. That would be effective for states where the uh, decedent uh, died uh, after December 31st, 2016, and thereafter. And finally, it eliminates the small <coughs> business and farm subtraction, and it also eliminates the recapture tax. The bottom line as to why I'm bringing this is a matter of fairness. And I have had a, a witness from my district in the past, uh, Bruce Mogren and other members of his family, talk about the impact it has on their family business. And as you'll hear in testimony, there's thousands of other small businesses, and whether they're family farms, uh, perhaps it's an apple orchard, or in the case in Maplewood, the, the situation is for an affordable senior housing complex that was developed by the Mogrens, their brothers, and through the nature of <coughs> that partnership, uh, when one of those brothers dies, it's not if, it's when, that whole business is totally at risk on the payment uh, that would come due for the estate tax. So it's a matter of preserving these small family businesses that have worked generations in many cases to establish that. And through the stop of one's heart at death, that whole business is potentially dissolved. And what can happen? Well, if they decide not to continue with uh, the Minnesota residency, they're going to just leave. 
And yes, there is a fiscal impact, but there's a fit on this. But in the name of fairness and keeping these people in Minnesota, the state that they love, where they're active in their community and want to stay, and where they are, they are paying taxes, there would be a continued impact by people that would leave. And you'll hear from a number of groups, CPAs will tell you that. When you have an unlevel playing field, it's gonna be a disincentive to stay in our great state. And so when I heard from the Mogren family and they couldn't be here today, they're saying, please, for our family business that we worked for generations, please, don't continue to put us at risk. And so I urge your support for Senate File 8. Uh, I, I thank Senator Anderson for his proposal. I do know, the, you know, Mr. Chair, that you have never been more popular in your life than right now in terms of proposals and recognizing that the insatiable appetite for additional tax uh, incentives is not going to be near uh, what your uh, target inevitably is. I think this proposal hits a sweet spot. So, you know, uh, Senator Weger, you're very kind, and thank you for the flattery. It wasn't, it wasn't so popular last night, though, about 445 <laughs> over in K-12 policy. But uh, Okay, well, Senator Weger, Senator Anderson, I don't know how you want to proceed. You could certainly, this is a little unusual, I admit, uh, but if you wish to both stay there, I guess that would be fine. And we could have the testifiers come up one, one at a time. Yeah, yes, Senator Senjo. Senator Senjo. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And a, a question for either one of you or maybe further witnesses. Uh, uh, do either of you have any sense as to how our state tax in Minnesota might compare to what we might call the prevailing uh, positions of other states around the country? <clears throat> <clears throat> Mr. Chair, Senator Senjum, we do not rank favorably. <coughs> I know that and the exact status now, uh, I'm sure we'll hear in testimony. Uh, Mr. Chair, S Senator Senjum, the, uh, I've been told and, and looked at statistics and we're third worst. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Senator Anderson, Senator Weaver. Uh, and Mr. Know. Chair, uh, on your question, and yes. excuse me, Senator Miller, you had asked, I think our preference is that we Pretty much the advocates for the bill uh, would speak to each of them, so there isn't any particular uh, need for having one person or the other. Okay, thank you, Senator Weger. Senator Miller. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And just to uh, maybe partially answer Senator Sendrum's question, from my understanding, Minnesota's only one of 14 states that still has an estate tax. <laughs> thank you, uh, thank you, Senator. Okay. Uh, we we do have uh, an expert. We saw the data yesterday, but we have the expert out in the audience somewhere. I do believe so. We'll get a definitive answer in a little bit on that. Uh, oh, okay, all right. Yes, uh, Senator Bach. Well, Mr. Chairman, maybe someone knows the answer to this. I don't. Years ago, Minnesota repealed its inheritance tax. And I'm wondering kind of what is the difference? I know Iowa doesn't have an estate tax provision, but they do have an inheritance tax. So as we start counting, are we 13th or 14th or where are we? Some states have an inheritance tax rather than estate tax. And I wonder if anybody knows the difference. Yeah. The, the Senator treated. Bach, we, uh, someone <coughs> from the, the foundation is here, I do believe. And does North, uh, uh, Ms. Pollack, do you have an answer to this, these questions? Yes. Well, Mr. Chair and Senator Bach, um, inheritance taxes are kind of the flip side of estate taxes. So they apply um, a, a rate um, based on a, a, a schedule of classes or level of inheritance to the um, person who receives the beneficiary of the estate, uh, whereas the estate tax is imposed on the um, estate that's left after the decedent dies, um, subtracting the... <coughs> the exclusionary amount. And the, and the net difference is, I mean, if who pays, so someone different pays the tax, but. Are, the inheritance tax, the individual pays it. Senator Rest. The state it. Senator Bach. But the money goes to the same place. <laughs> yes. So I'm just, I'm just wondering as it relates to, kind of, as it relates to tax liability, 
uh, what's the difference if the estate tax comes to Minnesota or the inheritance tax? And are they, because they, they act the same, I guess, is are the rates in of Iowa's inheritance tax similar to Minnesota's estate tax? Or it just seems like where there's, there's more going on than just how many states that have an estate tax provision. Ms. And it's not a large number of states that have an inheritance tax. You're, you're, Senator Bach, you're correct. Uh, Ms. Pollock, do you have a follow-up? Mr. Chair, no, but I can check that just a moment. I'll check on the Iowa rates. Okay. All right. Were there any more questions from our members? Okay. If, if not, then the first uh, person on the list to testify is Mr. Mr. Bromelkamp. Mr. Brummelkamp, please state your name for the record and proceed. My name is Mike Brummelkamp. Uh, Mr. Chair and members of the committee, glad to be back. Uh, happy to testify in support of uh, particularly Senate File uh, 8, but uh, basically all of the uh, uh, bills that are in front of you. I am a, a CPA shareholder with Olson Thielen, a CPA firm here in Roseville, Minnesota. I am a member of the uh, Minnesota CPA Society Board of Directors. I'm a member of the Minnesota Chamber of Commerce. And my expertise uh, in relation to the uh, uh, estate tax is I do a lot of business valuation involved with these estates and uh, collaborate with uh, 20 other partners in our firm to provide uh, estate planning uh, uh, services to our clients. Uh, I'll be, I'm certainly open for any questions. Uh, Mr. Chair, Senator Bach's question about inheritance uh, is, is very interesting because in Minnesota, since we do our estate planning, uh, uh, we are fortunate and we don't have the added complexity of an inheritance tax in order to do that uh, planning, but it certainly is, a, is an important uh, uh, issue to consider as we're uh, talking about the bills. Um, I'm appreciative that uh, Senator Rest was a day ahead of me here, and I knew that uh, uh, New Jersey was considering getting rid of it. I didn't know that they're actually down. So uh, we are only one of 13 states that has an estate tax, and our tax threshold at $2 million is much lower than the 5.49 of the federal. Um, the estate tax, in accordance and in addition to our uh, high income tax levels, does have a detrimental effect on tax planning for taxpayers in the state of Minnesota. And uh, I have testified in the past and will testify again today that uh, there are significant uh, uh, influences that are causing people to leave our state for these reasons. I have an example from a uh, uh, conversation that I had with one of my partners yesterday that we uh, did some tax planning in uh, late December, early January. Uh, and it's going to be a, an estate in the eight to ten million dollar range and they made the decision the day before yesterday to move to California even because in, in spite of the higher tax rates on uh, income in uh, California they'll save about two million dollars uh, when the estate is realized and I believe that this is a projected increasing trend in the state and uh, it is something that we should keep in mind as we are deliberating on uh, how we should handle the estate tax going forward uh, repealing, uh, getting in con federal conformity or at least moving toward conformity is going to be very important for us. Uh, it's important that we stay competitive, that we're able to uh, uh, encourage our uh, taxpayers who are here that have built uh, net worth to stay in the state so that they can help support our, uh, our uh, tax structures. And it is all about a sense of fairness and doing the right thing. Um, we're certainly... Uh, as practitioners, I can tell you that we have a significant amount of revenue in our organizations because we're doing tax planning and the complexity of the laws help us uh, maintain those uh, uh, revenues. Uh, if we can do a, uh, uh, an estate return uh, for a average sized uh, estate in the state of Minnesota, and I believe last year we had about 1,500 estate returns filed in the state, uh, can run anywhere between twenty and $45,000 in professional fees alone to get done. And I think anything we can do to uh, simplify, get in conformity with the federals or, or even uh, uh, the elimination could be very important. So 
uh, in summary, uh, uh, as a practitioner, a member of the uh, uh, CPA profession, uh, we support all of the bills that are being presented for you, and I think it's uh, a matter of you determining what the right thing to do at this point in time is. With that, I'm open to questions, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Ballenkamp. Any questions of Senator Anderson? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Bromelkamp, uh, heard this time and time again from, from different professional advisors. Uh, I, your example on, on the, the uh, client that's heading to California, is this a uh, recurring theme? Uh, how often do you think you're having this conversation with clients? Uh, <clears throat> I personally have this discussion several times a year, and I probably have about 300 clients that I work with significantly. Uh, our firm is a uh, medium-sized CPA firm with 100 employees, and we are working with small and medium-sized businesses with revenues between $1 million and $50 million. Uh, this has been a recurring, recurring theme for many years. I believe I was in here eight or nine years ago with the same testimony. And uh, I can tell you that I believe the trend is increasing, and it's something to be concerned about. Um, I can tell you in my own case, I'm approaching my retirement years, and uh, they are concerns for me as well. And I love this state, and my intention is to stay here under almost any, any conditions because I have family here and stuff like that, but I can tell you that my experience tells me that we have people leaving the state for, uh, uh, reasons when they're going to sell their business, for example, because we don't have capital gains treatment. They go move to Florida, sell the business. Uh, they may stay down there because they like the weather. Uh, they may come back because of our great health care. I'm a Rochester, uh, came from Rochester, and I, I believe the value of the clinic to the community and, and the quality of the health care you can get here in the Twin Cities is outstanding. But once people leave, that doesn't get a guarantee that they're going to come back for the health care. And uh, I, I can... I'm sworn to, to secrecy and privacy. I can't, I can't share specific names, but I can probably come up with 12 examples over the last five years of uh, significant uh, estates that uh, we have lost out on because residency was terminated and moved somewhere else. I wish I could be more specific. If I'm sitting in your chair, uh, I would want more evidence, and I understand that. Sen uh, I, I think Senator Rest was um, first. Okay. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, sir, the, uh, right now, um, the Senate File 8 also repeals the recapture tax, right. which um, uh, is imposed if someone's taken the small business um, exemption. exemption and then sells, sells a business within three years. How many um, are, not a number, but how... Uh, how frequently have any of your clients um, uh, uh, disposed of their business after having used the um, uh, exemption and had to pay the um, recapture tax because they sold Lacking the, the ability, Senator Rest, to go back and check that out. I don't recall any. Mr. Chairman, is it common? Senator Rest. Um, I don't believe that it's common. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Bromacamp. Next is Senator Gazelka. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. To the testifier, uh, so we've been looking at this issue for a while, and, and when we look at legislation, we can only score what the cost is for taxes. And show, we show in 2018 roughly $61 million of lost taxes, and we get a lot of anecdotal, and it's not really anecdotal, it's actually real people that are leaving. Uh, but do you know... Anybody that's measuring it, uh, do the CPAs, you know, is, is there any surveys being done? It would it'd be nice to at least have some estimate of what we're losing. Even though we don't use it here, I think it's still helpful uh, for us to know, you know, we see the cost of $61 million this first year, but we don't really see the cost of all the, the people that are leaving and they're not paying sales tax or property tax or income tax. And they're not being, they're no longer being uh, large donors to charities here. They're somewhere else doing that. So is there anything out there? I'm not aware of anything specific that's out there. I do know at the uh, uh, 
the um, Minnesota Society of CPAs, we have talked frequently about how we would try to get a measurement on that, and when we reach out to our members for that kind of specific information, we don't get anything back because we, they're unwilling to share details with us. Um, but I share, I share the desire to get that information. I don't have it, and I can't offer it. So, okay, sorry. Uh, just a first real formal meeting, so I have to remind people to Go through the Come chair. Come through the chair. Yeah, thank you. Senator Black. Well, Mr. Mr. Chairman, the department's here and watching, and Mr. Cummings maybe doesn't have the answer, but I'm just wondering, uh, on the bill summary, it says there were, in 2014, there were 1,100 returns that were subjected to this tax. I'm just kind of curious if the department could get us a number. How many of those 1,100 involve real estate? Uh, it, it seems like we're talking a lot about small business. I think oftentimes that real, that's real estate, and I'm just... Curious maybe to the, the testifier, because <clears throat> if you have real estate, there's a way to get around this. And, I, and I, I'm just wondering how often it's done where somebody that owns, say, a strip mall, parcel of property, sells it, and then within the window of time, I think it's 18 months, maybe buys, uh, reinvests the property in Florida where there's not an estate tax provision and does a 1031 exchange in order to just mm -hmm. avoid the tax liabilities. It seems like if you have real estate, you can avoid this if you'd like to. Is that, do you see that yeah, happen, 1031 exchanges? Mr. Balmacan? Yes, Mr. Mr. Chair, um, Senator Bach, I, <clears throat> I believe that that is one of the options and one of the alternatives. Um, most of what I see when I'm working with the estates is that uh, uh, they need to come up with valuations at the time of the, uh, the estate return is being filed that summarizes the uh, um, the value of that real estate at that time, and that's what the uh, tax is based on. Uh, when you're doing advanced planning, that is certainly one of the options that you do have, um, but there are many other options that you can get into. You can get into uh, uh, irrevocable trusts and all kinds of other uh, mechanisms that uh, can transfer title to heirs or related parties. Uh, but certainly 1031 exchanges over states, uh, federal law permits us to do that. So it is certainly a mechanism that is one of the tools in our tool bag. Uh, members, thank you, Mr. Bromelkamp. Members, we do have, still have a number of testifiers, so if it's okay, we'll move on to the next testifier. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You want, Senator Miller, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And just very quickly, the testifier mentioned federal conformity. I just want members to know that uh, we do have a bipartisan bill that will be introduced tomorrow in the Senate that is uh, straight federal conformity uh, for the estate tax. It wasn't ready for today, but um, that bill will be introduced uh, tomorrow. Thank you, Senator Miller. Thank you, uh, Mr. Baumelkamp. Bill Horn. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Bill Horn. I am also a CPA uh, by profession, and I'm a tax partner with RSM, uh, formerly known as McGladry, which is a national public accounting firm. Uh, thanks uh, for the opportunity to address your committee regarding the uh, uh, bill before us to repeal the Minnesota state tax. Uh, sign a significant amount of my time is spent uh, with estate planning, uh, particularly with uh, family, our successful family and business clients. Um, I would like to describe what I see in my practice as the impact of the Minnesota state tax on residents and Minnesota uh, businesses and family farms. I testify for outright repeal of the Minnesota state tax. Um, currently, as we've heard, uh, with the estate tax, Minnesota is an outlier to our neighboring states. Um, we are only one of 13 states that have a, a state tax. So it's the exception versus the rule. Uh, I believe that the Minnesota state tax is a, sig a significant factor in why successful Minnesota residents are leaving the state. Uh, wealth flight is real. Uh, we see it quite frequently, as Mike has uh, testified earlier. Uh, the combination of the Minnesota state tax and the fourth tier income tax um, are cited by our clients as a reason why they leave the state voluntarily. Uh, the Minnesota state tax also targets residents or states that are not subject to the federal tax, as we've heard. The Minnesota exemption is currently 1.8, gradually index or uh, increase in $2 million exemption, 
The federal currently is uh, five and a half million dollars. So Minnesota is taxing those, uh, that difference between the, uh, those estates that are not subject to a federal tax, but are subject to the Minnesota tax. And that incremental, that tax is $435,000. So it's not an insignificant amount. Um, you know, there have been su studies that uh, cite the Minnesota income tax as the primary reason for uh, people moving out of the state. It is. Uh, but recently, uh, we've had clients that are um, citing the Minnesota state tax for leaving the state. Uh, one reason it's, uh, uh, and they are leaving the state, and one reason it's a lot easier to move to avoid the Minnesota state tax than the income tax. Um, actually, a new tax haven for to avoid the Minnesota state tax is Hudson, Wisconsin. Uh, it's uh, quite easy to do. What you do is sell your Minnesota house as you age, you go over to Wisconsin, you still get to enjoy the Twin Cities, all but a, a little bit of a longer drive at times. But you, uh, the, with the estate tax you avoid provides a lot of opportunities to your children and grandchildren. It's a great motivator. Let's talk about businesses. Uh, the, the estate tax impact on our businesses is also very harmful. Uh, the, uh, the federal t state tax is just not Minnesota. The federal estate tax is a very it's a challenge for pro private businesses. But piling on the Minnesota estate tax is increasing that uh, burden tax burden by about twenty five percent. So it's not an insignificant burden. This uh, estate tax burden uh, is a significant challenge to private businesses and family farms uh, that often result in those businesses being sold. Um, and I question, what is, what is the public policy objective of the Minnesota state tax, uh, particularly as it affects uh, businesses and, and uh, family farms? Let's, let's just think, I'm gonna walk you through this process. Is, uh, take, a, take a business in outstate Minnesota. I, I presume many of you represent greater Minnesota communities. In those communities, uh, the largest employer in town is likely a private business. These businesses provide jobs, but they also contribute and again, significantly, I would suspect, to the local tax base. These same communities are the, probably the major supporters of the community civic uh, organizations, you know, kids, youth programs, the arts. Um, all these are, you know, these businesses are valuable assets to any community, particularly those in greater Minnesota. Now, one day, the owner dies. What happens? Uh, nine months after the date of death, this Minnesota business is now liable with an estate tax of up to 50% of the value uh, of the business. Un death is unavoidable, uh, it will happen, but the Minnesota, and this Minnesota business is not the same business it was the, the day before the date of death. It is now encumbered with a, a, a enormous debt burden and the chances of survival are diminished. Um, as often as the case, these businesses will get sold likely to non-local investors. And without local ownership, uh, the business is more likely to be moved and more likely that expansion could take place elsewhere. All this because someone dies. Uh, not because of poor business operations, but because of the crushing burden of the estate tax, including the Minnesota estate tax. The state does get its one-time tax collection, but at what cost? To jobs, uh, to the tax base, to community support, I would advocate we probably lose more than we collect on that one-time collection. I do advocate for the outright repeal uh, because it's the right thing to do from a, uh, in the long run. But at a minimum, I would uh, suggest the, starts, uh, the state conform entirely to the federal tax system. If we have a, if we have, a, if we are going to have an estate tax, we need to reduce the uh, the burden of the tax and simplify the administrative uh, burden. Uh, conformity to the federal system will do that. Uh, we talked about the small estates that are being taxed, uh, that two million to two and a half, uh, five and a half million currently. Uh, these states, these estates have no federal tax filing requirement. They, but they do have an, they incur an administrative burden because they have to file a Minnesota state specific estate tax return. Uh, conformity will reduce that burden to the smaller estates. As we talked before, those bubble estates, those small estates, they incur a, a, a $435,000 Minnesota state tax. Conformity would eliminate that. We can simplify the whole system, reduce the cost of the estates, 
from a state, from a Minnesota perspective, by just piggybacking off of an already uh, developed federal system, and just take a percentage, you can pick your percentage, but take a percentage of the federal system as tax amount, and you could simplify it. No adjustments, just a tax um, times the already computed federal tax base, and conformity will reduce the uh, the current redundant Minnesota state tax audits. I don't know if you know this, but currently Minnesota audits the same information the IRS audits. Um, it's redundant, it's costly, and it's unnecessary. Um, I, I testified a couple years ago before the House Tax Committee about uh, gift and estate tax issues, and at that time, the, uh, you might have updated numbers, but the reduction of, of, of tax collections to conformity was estimated at about $82 million. Uh, that number probably is updated in your, your current information. I would, a portion of that reduction though and conformity would be offset by you know, reducing the, uh, the administrative costs of, of the Minnesota Department of Revenue, their costs of uh, administering their state specific estate tax. I mean, if we just piggyback on the federal, we would reduce a lot of the, the, uh, our state costs for administering that. Even with conformity, we're still, Minnesota's still gonna be the outliner, one of the 13 states with a tax, but at least it would be less punitive particularly for those smaller estates. Um, thank you for the opportunity to testify. Uh, I will take questions if, if anyone has them. Thank, thank you, Mr. Horn. Are there any questions for Mr. Horn? Senator Rest. Mr. Chairman, it's, it's a lighthearted one, but <laughs> if we repeal the estate tax, how much business would you lose? Uh, I, I'm sorry, I can't. Mr. Horn? If we repeal the yeah. estate tax, how much business would, we, would you lose? It's a joke. <laughs> I know it's a joke, but uh, you know, uh, my C CPA brethren and a number of tax attorneys probably won't, you know, self-interest would say we shouldn't be saying this, but um, it's still the right thing. Our business would actually grow because more Minnesota businesses would stay here. Uh, wealth flight is for real, and I, I can give you stories of that if you want. Thank you, Mr. Horn. Any more questions for Mr. Horn? Thank you, Mr. Horn, for uh, testifying. So what we'd like to do is uh, if Ms. Cadoon, Mr. Hickey, and Mr. Crinky would, and uh, well, Thank you, uh, Mr. Crinky, Mr. Hickey, and Ms. Kadoon. Working out the kinks in the first day, so it'll go, it'll go better. Um, no, she has it there. So, uh, uh, who would like to go first? <coughs> Ladies first. <laughs> Thank you, right. Mr. Chair, Ms. members Kadoon. of the committee. Um, Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Uh, my name is Beth Cadoon. I represent the I'm Minnesota. I'm sorry, Ms. Cadoon, can I, may I just interrupt for a second? And I don't want to uh, take away anybody's time, but if uh, we've already covered the information, I think you two are well, you three are well versed in how this goes. So thank you very much. Continue, Ms. Cadoon. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My name again is Beth Cadoon. I represent the Minnesota Chamber of Commerce, an organization of 2,300 businesses across the state of Minnesota. You heard from two of our members, and I appreciate them being here to provide their expertise. Um, as was mentioned, I won't um, cover, there's a lot of uh, testifiers, so I'll just be very brief. Um, this is something that we've heard more and more from our members across all the state regarding really, unfortunately, an uptick in their business if they're CPAs, financial planners, and others, and really the detrimental impact of the estate tax. And it truly is in combination, as was mentioned, with our high individual income tax. So I just wanted to highlight, and this is one of the questions that was answered or, or asked earlier regarding our, our estate and how we compare with the, uh, the rest of the United States. So if you look at the back page of my handout, um, as was mentioned, Minnesota is now one of only 14 states, and it will certainly be soon be 13 with New Jersey's repeal that I believe is effective as 2018. Um, if you look at just the top five individual income tax states, which I'll mention right now, which is California, Oregon, 
Minnesota being number third for our high individual income tax, Iowa and New Jersey. Three of those states do not have an uh, estate tax, California, um, Iowa, and now New Jersey being repealed. Um, so Minnesota's and Oregon are the only two of those five, five high individual income tax states that have the um, estate tax. Oregon does not have a sales tax. So if you look at that, then uh, this map, Minnesota is then of the five highest individual income tax states in the nation. Uh, Minnesota is also one that has the estate tax and also has all the other major taxes with the, sa the sales tax as well. If you just look at this map as well, um, if you look on the um, west coast, Washington has the estate tax, but they have no income tax. Um, if you look closest to it with Illinois, their top individual income tax is 3.75%. So their top rate, which is a flat rate, is actually lower than our lowest rate. Um, if you look on the East Coast, which is where we see more of these estate tax, um, New York is what we typically think of another high in, you know, tax state. Their tax is um, individual income tax, state tax is actually lower at 8.98%. Um, and they, went, they have now went to the um, federal estate tax threshold under Governor Cuomo, made that move a few years ago because they were seeing uh, you know, detrimental impact in their state due to their um, estate tax. So as mentioned, what's really changed is more and more states are making changes um, to their estate tax, either getting into federal estate tax threshold conformity or completely repealing it. So Minnesota is becoming more and more of a tax outlier in this area, and we think it's time to really remove the strong financial disincentive to remain in Minnesota, <coughs> and as you heard, does detrimentally impact small business and farmers. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Kadoon. Well, if we could hold questions until we hear all three testifiers. Thank you, Ms. Kadoon. Mr. Chairman, Ms. Hickey, uh, Mike Hickey Mr. with Hickey. the National Federation of Independent Business. Great to be in your committee and see all you guys again. Uh, thanks for the time you're, you're focusing on this, on this critical issue. Uh, this is our top priority in taxes, and uh, uh, I think we're the most affected business group and certainly one of the most affected groups. We uh, have 11,000 small business owners, and many are family-held and uh, they struggle to continue uh, traditions and family-run businesses and farms. And we do have the carve-out and appreciate all you who have supported that in the past, but this is a simpler, cleaner way to go, and we're hoping with yet another large budget surplus, this is finally the year we can conform to the uh, federal exemption and, uh, and make it so much easier for people when they're dealing with uh, these situations at a, at a, point, of, at a point of death. Uh, we support both bills. I've always been just a little bit puzzled why, why Senator Weger's bill comes just short of conformity because people, even though it's a good bill, people are going to have to deal with uh, accountants still and attorneys on that small amount. The federal's at 5.45 million on a COLA. That's an odd number. It's on a COLA, and it's going to keep going up. And so over time, if we don't resolve this, there would be a, a more significant gap between the limit in the in Senator Weger's bill and uh, where the federal's at. Uh, Senator Anderson's bill uh, obviously completely takes care of the problem. It would be great to get out of that category of 13 states that still uh, do this. But as uh, some great testimony here today is... Uh, as uh, Mr. Horn pointed out, a lot of those 13 are conformed, or some are. So you know, we're just way behind here. And uh, so anyways, appreciate the time you're putting into this today. This is our top priority. Hopefully this is finally the year we can do it with another large surplus. Thank you, Mr. Hickey. Uh, Mr. Krinke. Uh, thank you. Uh, obviously a pleasure to be here. Uh, uh, I think the last time I was in this room was uh, for a conference committee uh, several years ago. but. Uh, Always a pleasure to be here and to uh, have the opportunity. <laughs> um, I think the, uh, the thing that uh, we uh, often don't think about uh, in, uh, in the situation of taxes or certainly in the circumstance of the state taxes is uh, we never know when we're going to die. Uh, some people like to think they know. <clears throat> some people like to predict. Uh, I was shocked just a matter of a few weeks ago when a former employee of mine who uh, started his own heating and air conditioning company uh, died of a heart attack at age 58. Uh, a little difficult uh, for uh, not only the, the family, he had two, two sons that uh, worked in the business uh, with him. And uh, <clears throat> again, struggling uh, entrepreneurs starting businesses uh, is one situation. 
uh, they're not going to be facing this tax. But the folks that uh, uh, have struggled for many years, uh, 30, 40 or more years, as uh, Mr. Weger mentioned, the Mogren family, uh, I happen to know my, my brother worked for them uh, years ago. Uh, so now you have, uh, again, built, a, built an operation, built a business, uh, as was said earlier, uh, a key business in a small town in the state of Minnesota, and all of a sudden, uh, that heart attack comes, uh, that diagnosis of cancer. So you don't have necessarily uh, months or years to, to plan out what uh, the future of your business or how you're going to disperse uh, some of those assets. Uh, how are you going to pay the tax? Uh, the, uh, all of a sudden, uh, the folks that uh, were struggling and working diligently every day to keep the business going are faced with uh, that dilemma. Uh, as again was uh, mentioned earlier, uh, many times results in the sale of a business. So yes, this is uh, economically a fundamental thing for the uh, uh, economic growth and prosperity of the state of Minnesota. Uh, so the, let me just uh, say that uh, again, few of us in the small business arena are calculating every day what the value of our property or the value of our business uh, might be. And I think the, uh, the CPAs uh, here earlier could also tell you that uh, valuation of a, a small closely held corporation is, uh, is an art, it's not a science. What, what, is, it, uh, what, is, it, what is your business worth? Uh, so again, few uh, business people, they're endeavoring to grow their business. They're endeavoring to uh, serve uh, the, their customers to make their products. They're not turning around every moment and talking to their CPA or to estate planners saying, well, what's going to happen in the event of my death? So again, uh, maybe rather than calling it the death tax, maybe you should call it the gotcha tax. Uh, I think the uh, uh, prince's heirs might be looking at that right now, saying all of a sudden, uh, by the way, if you are calculating what the uh, what the uh, tax consequences or the tax benefits to the state of Minnesota. You might add uh, the Prince of State because they're going to be paying uh, a substantial portion of estate taxes here coming up in about, uh, uh, well, coming up uh, this tax year. So I can see Senator Box already, uh, the wheels are spinning, but. <laughs> Spending the money, Mr. Chair. <laughs> so, <laughs> so uh, so, go ahead, Mr. Krinky. And uh, let's, uh, let me just uh, say for a moment here that uh, I, I don't think that, and I understand the challenges that uh, the tax committee has, uh, have been there and done that uh, when you look at uh, every quote unquote uh, uh, repeal of a tax or lessening of a tax results in a, uh, in a negative number for uh, the chair and for the uh, the committee as they're trying to put together a tax bill. But uh, I don't think the reasons uh, that are often stated uh, maybe behind closed doors uh, for tax legislation are, number one, we need the money. Uh, that doesn't seem to me to be a potent reason for why you shouldn't uh, <clears throat> forward good tax policy. Uh, another reason uh, that I don't think you should use is, well, it only affects a very small percentage of people. Uh, yes, it affects a small percentage of people, but the consequences can be devastating to a small business owner. And uh, the other one is, uh, I don't think we want to hang the sign out in the state of Minnesota that we really don't like rich people. Uh, small business people who are successful employ uh, hundreds of thousands of Minnesotans, and I think, uh, as I said, keeping those people here, uh, maybe we don't have statistics on how many people are leaving, but regardless of that, even one person uh, that has been a successful business owner in this state who has been a generous <clears throat> and a community-oriented individual leaves this state, I don't think that's a good thing. So uh, again, uh, repeal, Outright repeal is the best, but uh, might also mention we could have uh, bipartisan uh, support here this morning if you uh, did a phase out of the estate tax in Minnesota as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Kirkke. Uh, members, any questions for the testifiers? Senator Anderson. And, oh, 
One moment, Senator. I guess uh, Senator Bach was first. Uh, just, <clears throat> just, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Hickey, just a little bit of counsel. Uh, words matter. Uh, I uh, had a good conversation just the other day with one of, one of my NFP, NFIB member businesses, and uh, Mr. Hickey, it is a great organization. I don't know if it's the best, uh, uh, as you might have described it, but I, I do think it is the most grassroots, and, and I congratulate you for uh, the effort you've put into uh, kind of getting all of these small businesses all over the state under one umbrella. So thanks for bringing that. Uh, you're definitely the most grassroots business organization in the state. Thank you, Senator Bach. Senator Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Ms. Cadoon, um, you know, outside of uh, LRIDE repealing, uh, if, if we're able to conform with the federal exemption, uh, where do we land then from going from third worst state to um, on the Forbes list of on where not to die? M Mr. Chair. Ms. Kadoon. Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Um, I have not ranked where we might necessarily fall under the Forbes list or the Kiplinger's um, list of kind of where they're look at where you don't want to die. Um, most states have gone to the federal state threshold that do have the, um, still have the, the, the estate tax. Um, so I think we'd probably move from third to maybe not in the top five, hopefully. Um, so that would be my speculation on that ranking. Thank you, Ms. Kadoon. Any more questions? Not. Uh, thank you, Ms. Kadoon, Mr. Hickey, and Mr. Krinky. Thank you very much. So I'd like to call up next uh, Mr. Nelson and Ms. Scarborough. Scarborough. Mr. Nelson, Ms. Scarborough, uh, who would like to go first? Uh, I guess I'll go first. Okay, Mr. Nelson. Mr. Chair, members of the committee, it's a pleasure to be here today. And I'll focus most of my time talking about the evidence that we have that people are actually moving out of Minnesota, due at least in part to the estate tax. And um, I want to start a little bit just by saying, talking about the principles of sound tax policy, because the estate tax might be the most unprincipled tax that we have on the books. Uh, the Department of Revenue published a report in 2011 on tax expenditures where we had a number of economists who came from across the ideological divide to, to agree on what are some sound principles we should go by. Simplicity was one. This is not a simple tax. We've already heard about how complicated it is, can, can be to value an estate. Um, and we also are looking at, uh, ta we want taxes to treat people equally when they're equally situated. These, this tax falls differently on people uh, that might have a similar wealth, but it just depends on the property that they, the types of property that they own. But the most important uh, thing that this violates is efficiency. Um, we don't want a, taxes to distort behavior, and this tax provides a strong incentive for people to distort their behavior to avoid the tax because it's such a large tax uh, that falls on such a narrow group of people. And so what we, we do see a lot of people changing a lot of behaviors. Um, they might sell a business, they might dissolve a business, um, they might gift a business to their children in some way, shape, or form. But the easiest thing people can do is leave the state of Minnesota. And so I went through and I, I've researched this for a number of years. and. There is a problem when you're asking this question because there's very little empirical research out there that says one way or the other. And that's largely because uh, no one tracks wealth. If you want to find some empirical research on whether wealthy people are moving, you have to first identify the wealthy people. Uh, the Federal Reserve Board tracks wealthy people, but not by state. And so uh, what we are left with is tracking people usually by their income, looking at income as a proxy for wealth, and even then we've got problems because the fact of the matter is the estate tax at the state level really only started mattering around 2006. Prior to that, we had a federal pickup credit that largely uh, meant the federal government paid the state estate tax. So to the extent there is empirical research out there, it largely covers this period of time where the estate estate tax really didn't change incentives because of this federal uh, tax credit. Um, so we're left with trying to look for other types of uh, data points and other information. And so I've looked at a lot of different things. And first off, we can just look at common sense. Uh, people are going to avoid a tax if they can. And we see that when you look at the income tax collections of trusts and estates. 
uh, income tax collections in South Dakota, the per return income tax collection in South Dakota is $72,482 per trust and estate return. In Minnesota, it's about 10 times less. It's $7,829. Clearly, people live in South Dakota because they don't have an income tax. Uh, and people have those trust and estates there. People change their behavior, clearly. Um, we also have the, just the existence of the estate planning industry that provides this sort of advice. People wouldn't be offering this advice if it wasn't and people, if they didn't think people were going to take that advice. The next thing we have, we have surveys. Um, someone asked before whether there is some evidence of how much um, money we're leaving or how many people are moving. Twin Cities Business surveyed last year um, a number of estate planners, attorneys, and other people that advise wealthy people. And in that, they surveyed, they put a survey out to 400 of these people. They got 150 people to respond to that survey. And they used a firm called the Morris Leatherman Company to try to ascertain uh, how much, what these 150 surveys meant really to the entire state. They tried to look at the, the responses uh, related to how much wealth uh, the people had that were leaving, the incomes that they had. And what they found is that taxpayers, uh, these taxpayers that were leaving, uh, left with an estimated $2.1 billion in taxable income. And they also took with them uh, $17 billion in median net worth and $31 billion in median gross estate value. Those are substantial sums of money. And this data is also very consistent with a lot of the IRS data that I've looked at. Um, and so I'll conclude with talking a little bit about this IRS data. The IRS tracks the movement of people uh, between states, and they track every tax return. This is a very good set of data to understand, to start understanding migration patterns because it really isn't a sample. It tracks every tax return. And when you look at people leaving, uh, we, are see, we see Minnesota loses people to lower tax states, states that don't have the estate tax, states that don't have an income tax. And when you look at the amount of income that we're losing, because it does track income as well, we do lose substantial income. And in 2014, we lost nearly a billion dollars in income to, uh, to this movement between the states. And in 2015, that dropped. We lost about half that, but we also saw just a remarkable drop in migration to and from Minnesota. But one thing that the IRS released in 2015, which is remarkable, is that they released some more data. They released data on who is moving by their age and by their income. So I told you before that you know, we can kind of look at income as a proxy for wealth. And so we can look at these higher income people and see whether Minnesota loses higher income people. And what we find is that Minnesota does lose higher income people at a higher rate than most states. So when you look at people that are making more than $200,000 a year, Minnesota in 2012 ranked 40th in the country for losing this set of people. In 2013, we ranked 42nd. In 2014, we ranked 42nd again. And again, in 2015, we ranked 41st. And when you look at the states that lose this higher income population um, in 2015, we find that most of the states that are in that top 10 have some sort of death tax, whether it's an estate tax or an inheritance tax. Seven of the 10 states uh, that, lose these, that lose people are in that top tax bracket. Right. And, and I think me, all of that... Can I just clarify something? So you mentioned 42nd. So we're talking about it's kind of inverse, right? We're 42nd worst. 42nd worst. Okay, thank you. Yes. Continue. Thank you, Mr. Nelson. Yes, Mr. Chair. So we are, we are ranked in the bottom 10 of states when it comes to losing or attracting, I guess, high-income people. Um, and, and so that's a serious problem for the state of Minnesota. And I think all of that together provides strong evidence that Minnesota is indeed losing wealthy people, and it is in part driven by the estate tax. Clearly, people move for various reasons, um, but the estate tax, and again, I will go back to that Twin Cities business survey, because that survey asked these estate planners why did they leave, and the top, th top two reasons were the estate tax and the income tax. And that's, in my mind, very powerful evidence to get rid of this tax, maybe more powerful evidence is the fact that other states agree with that. New Jersey just repealed their estate tax. Maryland and New York raised their estate tax to the, 
to the federal exemption amount. These are not uh, red states. These are blue states that figured out that their state tax was having an impact, a negative impact on their state. I think we should look to those states for some guidance. And um, to conclude, I would like to back up what Phil Krinky just said, that you know maybe we should be thinking about something a little bit different. Maybe we should be thinking about phasing the estate tax out and, and possibly adding a trigger to only phase it out when our revenues uh, justify eliminating that, that revenue source. Um, I think that might be an easier way, to, an easier pill to swallow, uh, because this tax does bring in about $180 million a year. Uh, so I think that might be just a little easier route forward. With that, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee for letting me be here today. My name is Morgan Scarborough, and I'm a policy analyst at the Tax Foundation. Um, for those who don't know us, we're a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization that's been around since 1937 monitoring tax policy. Um, we take no position on legislation, but I'm happy to share our research on estate taxes across the country. So to start out with, one of the issues we see in Minnesota is that Minnesota's exemption is much lower than the federal exemption. Um, so this year, Minnesota's exemption is at 1.8 million, which is significantly lower than the federal exemption of 5.49 million. Um, so what this means is that 90% of estates in Minnesota that are paying the state estate tax are not paying the federal estate tax. And those 90% are generating 50% of the estate tax revenue in Minnesota. Um, so that also adds a little bit of complexity to the tax code when you don't conform to the federal exemption. Also, Mr. Nelson's right, most states do not have an estate tax. Minnesota is one of only 14 states in D.C. that still do, and state tax trends are starting to move away from estate taxes with New Jersey phasing theirs out and other states raising their exemption. Um, and this can make Minnesota uncompetitive both regionally and on a national scale as well. And so also I think what's important to talk about, it's hard to quantify estate tax data because state-to-state um, -state migration is hard to monitor. So what we also can think about is how the estate tax can disincentivize business investment. So think about if you're a business owner and you're planning on um, purchasing new business equipment, but you're also planning for the estate tax. You might make the decision not to invest and not to buy that new equipment, or you might make the decision to buy smaller, less costly um, new equipment. Also, if you're looking to buy new land and you're planning for the estate tax, you might decide not to, not to get that land, not to invest in Minnesota, or you might be will, less willing to pay a high price per acre. So we really can also think about um, what are some of the unseen consequences of the estate tax. And on a macro level, um, when you're looking at decreased investment in the state, that can have very negative consequences for GDP and output. And so also, um, the Tax Foundation has a taxes and growth federal tax model that scores uh, the impact that taxes have on the economy. So we can't do state-specific uh, federal or state-specific state tax scoring, but we have uh, modeled the repeal of the federal estate tax on economic growth. And what our federal economists have found is that the static score of repealing the federal estate tax is $240 billion over 10 years, but after accounting for dynamic effects like economic growth, that cost falls to about $19 billion. Um, more importantly, this change increases long-run long economic growth by 0.8% and leads to an extra 159,000 full-time jobs. Also, it grows after-tax incomes by about 1%. Now, obviously, these can't be directly comparable to Minnesota as what they are on the federal level, but we believe that those trends would also hold still in Minnesota. So in conclusion, the estate tax hurts Minnesotans and makes, them, makes the state less competitive. It's also worth noting that in federal tax reform and the discussion, President Trump and the House GOP blueprint both eliminate the estate tax. Um, if the estate tax is eliminated on the federal level, that will lead to much higher administration costs in Minnesota. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Carver. I do have a question for back up. Mm -hmm. I mean, the economists said the initial cost of the federal repeal estate tax was $240 billion. Mm -hmm. $240 billion. Yes. only $19 billion. And so that takes into account um, the increased economy, increased output, increased investment. 0.8% long run economic growth, yes. Thank you.
Hello, Mr. Oh, excuse me. <clears throat> Hello, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. Oh, sorry. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. Uh, my name is Nan Madden. I'm director of the Minnesota Budget Project. The Minnesota Budget Project is an initiative of the Minnesota Council of Nonprofits, and we identify and promote public policies to expand opportunity and economic security to all Minnesotans. In tax policy, our priorities are an equitable tax system that raises the revenues needed to sustainably fund our priorities as a state. I appreciate the opportunity to express some concerns with the bills before you today to repeal or significantly cut the estate tax. Our primary concerns are first, the cost of these bills, uh, which could crowd out other priorities, and secondly, that these bills would create an uneven playing field among Minnesota taxpayers. So our first concern is the cost of these bills, which is $139 million uh, in the 18-19 biennium for Senate File 8, and $306 million for Senate File 83, and those uh, costs grow over time. I'd like to just broaden the discussion a little bit. Uh, this committee and the various budget committees of the legislature will be making important tax and budget choices this session. Um, and you'll need to decide whether repealing or dramatically cutting the estate tax for a small number of the largest estates uh, should take priority over other choices you could make that would have a greater impact on Minnesotans across the state, such as sustainably funding services for the elderly and people with disabilities, making childcare and college education more affordable, or in this committee, passing a more broadly based uh, tax cut. A second concern is that the estate tax plays an important role in providing a level playing field among taxpayers. That is because the estate tax serves as a backstop to the income tax and applies to the increased value of assets, such as stocks that are held in large estates that otherwise would not be taxed. These bills would eliminate or greatly uh, weaken that backstop. The more we erode the estate tax, the more that unrealized capital gains held in large estates will go entirely untaxed. Those who have the means to hold appreciated assets through their lifetimes will not pay taxes on those gains, and that is a benefit that's not available uh, to those who um, are not able to hold their assets for that time period. Research on estates nationally finds that unrealized capital gains make up a large portion of the assets in estates, especially large estates. Unrealized capital gains make up about one third of estates uh, worth five and 10 million, and 55% of the value of estates worth more than 100 million. Um, and finally, I just would like to um, speak a little bit to the arguments that these cuts are needed in response um, to tax migration. Um, certainly, um, no one would argue that there aren't people leave the state and they don't, and that uh, when people do that, they do that for various reasons. Um, but the academic research that looks at uh, changes in state tax policy over a 30 year period finds that uh, patterns of migration have been pretty consistent over time, even as um, there have been a lot of changes in tax policy between states. Um, so while it may be a driver of people's decisions to move, I think it's hard to argue that taxes are the primary driver. Uh, we think also when we look at the data, including the IRS data and others, that the economic impact of moves that do occur um, has been overstated. Um, because of these concerns, the cost of the tax, um, the, the cost of the tax cut, and the creation of uneven tax treatment among taxpayers we would ask you not to enact these bills this year and instead consider other choices that would have a greater impact on Minnesotans all across the state. Um, and you may wanna consider a more targeted approach if there are um, circumstances related to small family businesses and farms that you feel need some additional attention, you could build on some of the work that has already occurred there. 
um, but a more tar targeted approach might make a little more sense. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Madden. I ask again that uh, we'll let the three testifiers finish, and then we'll have questions if there are any, and our plan is to still be out of here by 10 or a couple minutes after, since we started a few minutes late. So, Mr. Rice, you may proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank My you. name is Brian Rice. I'm an attorney in Minneapolis, and I'm here this morning representing uh, AFSCME Council 5. AFSCME Council 5 is a union of 43,000 state and local government uh, workers who share many of the concerns that uh, Ms. Madden uh, testified uh, to about the, the overall budget picture. Um, this committee has the responsibility for managing the revenue side of the state's operation, which you know is now uh, about 45 billion in the next in the upcoming biennium. Um, the estate tax is only seven tenths of that, um, or about 306 million. But it's a it's a pretty important component. We feel uh, for this reason, as Miss Madden said, you you guys write the checks or raise the revenue so that the whole rest of the operation uh, can function. And so if you put it in context, the general fund spending uh, estimated for the transportation is 243, uh, 243 million next biennium. Um, debt service is 256 million. The committee center Senjum has jurisdiction on. This estate tax raises more than both of those items and almost as much as you'll Post spending on the environment and agriculture, which is about 400 million, and same uh, with the jobs and economic development uh, division. So, this committee does have tough choices. Um, this tax uh, is cer certainly worth examining to see if it makes sense in terms of the state's budget, but it is a significant generator of uh, revenue for the whole uh, state enterprise. And maybe one other point that I'd like to make, and I know. The, the committee spent a fair amount of time on this already, but to the extent members of the committee are concerned about the overall tax system and its progressivity, um, and, and you'll be seeing the tax incident study, I'm sure, spending some time on that when that report comes out, and I believe it's February. Um, this estate tax is the most progressive tax that you have in your um, panoply of taxes. It's point, positive point. 862, which correlates to almost as the most progressive way that you could have a tax system where the, the in, individuals in the state with the most money, a, a point plus 1.0 would mean that the very wealthiest Minnesotans are paying all the taxes to run uh, the system. Overall, Minnesota's tax system is slightly regressive on the suits index at uh, negative 0.035. Um, the income tax is a positive uh, 2.31 um, and helps balance that out. So just by means of comparison, this particular tax, um, it maybe call it an ingredient, Mr. Chair, if you're the one making the, the, the chili, this is probably maybe the most spicy one, but it's also one that really does move up the progressivity index. And Mr. keeps Mr. the middle. As, as, as long as you make food references, are okay. But you're going to lose me with the. I've read the incident study. It's not exciting. So, you know, thanks for the numbers, but <laughs> okay. you're going to kill us. All right. Well, it, it is an important as you as this committee gets to the overall tax system and how it balances out and whether it's fair or not. And that's a concern of uh, my client asked me to make sure that uh, it is an equitable. Uh, and fair system, and we'll all have a slightly different perspective on that. But as Ms. Madden said, this really does get to a, a, a certain element, people that have had assets for a long time perhaps, uh, have not paid capital gains, and, and it's one uh, window uh, upon which it can happen. So with that, I conclude my remarks. Thank you, Mr. Rice. Mr. Cummings. Uh, good morning, Mr. Chair, Senators Weger and Anderson, and members. For the record, my name is Paul Cummings, and I'm the Tax Policy Manager at the Minnesota Department of Revenue. Before I begin, Mr. Chair, I just wanted to thank you and uh, to let you know that I look forward to working with you, Mr. Chair. I've appreciated our working relationship in the past related to dyslexia. Uh, the Department has certainly noticed that as you begin this term, you have attr attracted a top-notch committee staff, and we sure look forward to working with the staff. 
Uh, Mr. Cummings, I, we can't let the compliments go. So thank you very much. And we do have a top-notch staff. So thank you very much. <laughs> Enjoyed working with you as well. Yes. Continue. Um, and as the new DFL lead, um, Senator Rest, we certainly look forward to working with you. We have a high regard for your experience working on tax committee. And um, we really thank you for your continued leadership in this area, as well as Senator Bach and Gazelka and Dietzik and Senjum, who we worked with in the past. And we do look forward to working with the new members of the committee as well. I, I hate to lighten it up, but have, we, have you missed anybody? <laughs> okay, go, continue, Mr. Cummings. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, to Senator Bach's question, um, you asked about, uh, you know, when we get past the point of the small um, business and farm exclusion, most estates do have a component um, and some a large component with the real estate component as part of it. As we work to put together a state budget, we have to ask ourselves, how do we build a framework that works for all Minnesotans? Um, the state budget, including the tax bill, will represent choices about priorities. As the committee considers the many changes that will come before it, we think it is helpful to have some context about the number of people affected um, by proposed tax law changes. For example, under Minnesota law, approximately 6% of deaths in the state are required to file under the estate tax. About um, two and a half are, um, have, to pay, uh, have to pay any estate tax under current law. The Tax Research Division of the Department of Revenue estimates that uh, the 2.5% 2, 2 equates to about 1,100 estates that have any tax due under current law. Uh, that is the number of taxpayers impacted by Senator Anderson's bill. Senator Weger's bill would impact about 580 taxpayers. Um, the cost of these bills in the upcoming biennium is between 138 million and 306 million, um, and those numbers will rise into future biennia. As we work together to design a revenue system that supports tax cuts and investments in education, healthcare, environment, and transportation, among others, we must consider the large cost of these proposals as well as the number of taxpayers impacted in the context of the larger state budget. One consequence of expanding the exemption is that many unrealized capital gains would go untaxed in Minnesota. This happens when an asset that is increased in value is not sold during the owner's lifetime. Under the current tax system, capital gains tax is due on the appreciation of assets such as real estate, stock, or an art collection only when the owner realizes the gain, usually by selling it. The increase in value of an asset is never subject to income tax if the owner holds on to it, um, holds on to that asset until death. During, during Governor Dayton's time in office, Minnesota has already made important changes to the estate tax. The small business and qualified farm deductions passed in 2011 um, and provide relief to family farms and small businesses being passed down. For context, about um, 300 estates claim the small business and or farm property subtraction per year. Fewer than 10 estates um, annually claim uh, the maximum subtraction, meaning fewer than 10 are paying the estate tax each year. In 2014, the governor and legislature took action again on the estate tax, raising the exemption over 1 million. In fact, these changes are still taking effect with the um, estate tax exemption having increased to 1.8 this year and it will increase again to 2 million next year. Senator Anderson talked about many complications in the issues as cited in our 2014 report, including a 41% rate on the smallest estates. Mr. Chair, many of these um, issues were resolved in the 2014 reforms. Earlier this month, Governor Dayton and Lieutenant Governor Smith proposed changes to the estate tax law so that where farmland is acquired by government units through eminent domain, an heir would not have to pay the recapture tax for inherited farmland subject to the estate tax. We ask for your consideration um, for this as part of our omnibus. Mr. Uh, Mr. Cummings, tax. would you repeat that last sentence, please? Yes. <clears throat> uh, so Governor Dayton and Lieutenant Governor Smith proposed changes to the estate tax so that where farmland is acquired by government units through eminent domain, an heir would not have to pay the recapture tax for inherited farmland subject to the estate tax. So, ouch, continue. <laughs> we respectfully ask for your consideration um, to be included as part of your omnibus tax bill, um, Mr. Chair. 
Uh, in closing, the estate tax is the, um, by far the most progressive tax in the state, according to the incident study. As you know, um, overall, Minnesota has a regressive state and local tax system, meaning effective tax rates are lower for those with higher incomes compared with middle-income Minnesotans. Increasing or eliminating um, the estate tax will make our system more regressive, which means middle and lower income Minnesotans will be paying for a larger share of the services we all share and depend on. The estate tax is a component of the revenue system that helps ensure fiscal balance for our state. As we move forward in this session, we look forward, forward to discuss priorities for tax expenditures and the many priorities related to tax law changes. If these bills move through the process, Mr. Chair, the Department of Revenue stands ready to working with you, to Senators Weger and Anderson, and it sounds like Senator Miller and staff. Thank you for the opportunity to be a resource. Thank you, Mr. Cummings and testifiers. Uh, members, are there any questions for the testifiers? Senator Senjum. Uh, thank you, Senator Chamberlain, Mr. Chair, uh, and not, not a question. Uh, as I was listening to the testimony, I was reminded of a, an occurrence about a, maybe a year and a half ago. I was at, down in Hayward, Minnesota with about four other legislators at a Farm Bureau meeting. There were 47 farmers there. I, I, I counted them. And there was a point where it was time for questions, and no one seemed to have one. So I had one. And so I simply asked, uh, who among you uh, think there's a reasonable likelihood that you're going to be able to pass your farm on to your, uh, to your family, your successors. Not one of those 47 farmers raised their hand. This tax policy issue is a, is a, is a powerful issue in, in agriculture as well. I wish there were, and maybe there are uh, representatives of agriculture here, but we need to think about that a lot if we want to save the family farm. Thank you, Mr. Senjum. Uh, Senator Senjum. Senator Miller. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, my question is for Ms. Madden, and I'm just uh, curious more than anything, are you aware of any research or uh, are you aware uh, of any instances where charitable giving uh, increases uh, as a result of, say, uh, lower estate taxes being paid or lower income taxes being paid? Um, Mr. Chair, uh, Senator Miller, um, the Minnesota Council of Nonprofits' uh, position is that we think the estate tax provides incentives for charitable giving because there is a deduction from the estate uh, for charitable giving. We think uh, the estate tax actually creates incentives for charitable, givings and charitable giving, and um, we are, we're concerned about the uh, reduction in incentive um, from weakening the estate tax. I can provide you with some um, ad additional information on that. Thank you. Any other questions for the testifiers? Thank you, Mr. Cummings, Ms. Naiman, and Mr. Rice. So what we have is we have one more testifier, uh, Mr. Skillbred, and then the intent is to bring up each of the authors separately and then deal with your respective bills, okay? Welcome, thank to you, the, Mr. Chairman and members. For welcome to the committee, Mr. Skelbred. And I, I just ask, in the interest of time, if there's some new information, happy to hear it. Okay, thank you. Thank you. My name is David Skelbred. I'm the Vice President of Government Relations for the Independent Community Bankers of Minnesota. Uh, bankers that are all and all of them are privately held. So we're interested in this issue, and so are the people that we serve, uh, small businesses in Minnesota. I'll try to do two things. Number one, be brief, and number two, provide you with some information or thoughts that we haven't had yet. As I think about this tax, I think about two things. Number one, what is its purpose? And number two, what are the consequences? I did a little research, and it was interesting to find that since in 1797, the tax became applied, and it was to pay for the war at that time. And then it was repealed when the war against France was over. And then it was taken up again in the Civil War. And then it was repealed. And that continued until 1916, when a major reform tax bill was passed at the federal level. And then that tax became permanent. There were exemptions, just like there are now. And according to some data that I read, the exemption at 
the time of 1916 was $50,000 on the federal side. In today's money, that would be 11 million. I think that's an important figure, in fact, to look at at the state level and at the federal level. The point being that we are behind the inflation and the growth. With regard to the consequences, uh, Mr. Weger's constituent, I, I think, was very, very good in explaining the situation that he was in and his family. And I think that those comments that he made were not individual, but were very broad-based and common to a lot of other family businesses. What does the tax do in Minnesota or at the federal level to some businesses, particularly those small family businesses? Well, it threatens the, the business or it kills the business. Many people are left with two options. One is to sell property. There is a farm that I read about in another state, but I think it's generic and can apply here. The farm was started in 1807. It was 600 acres. When the grandmother died, they sold 120 acres. And then my question was, what will happen when the next person dies? They went from 600 to 480. Are they gonna sell again? The other option is to borrow. But if you borrow money, and in their case it was in the millions, uh, to pay the federal tax, and I think that in this uh, context of Minnesota, it might be less, but the borrowing is still an option. But in that case, then you burden the family and you burden the business with debt that is going to be carried for many years, and perhaps it's carried until the next person dies. So whatever the consequence is, either, either selling property or borrowing money to pay the taxes, Either way, the business is severely compromised, and the family and their way of earning a living is severely compromised. I'll close with a uh, comment that, that I read about the CBO. In July 2005, the CBO report on this issue showed that the current tax, even with the exemptions provided by Congress, still had a harmful effect on families trying to keep a business or a farm. And with that, I'll close. Thank you, Mr. Skilbred. Any questions for the testifier? If not, thank you very much, sir. And uh, with that, Senator Anderson, would you? <coughs> so, um, First, are there any final questions for Senator Anderson and his SF-83? If not, Senator Anderson, do you have any closing final comments? Let freedom ring. <laughs> okay. Well, the intent is to uh, hold over for possible inclusion in the tax omnibus bill. All right? Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Senator Weger. Senator Weger, I have to correct my language uh, for Senator Anderson laid over for possible inclusion. Working out the kinks, Senator Weger. Senator Weger, you have any questions for Senator Weger members? Not Senator Weger, any final comments, summary? No, uh, Mr. Chair, members, thank you very much for your thoughtful consideration. And again, on behalf of the small family businesses that are living in anxiety, that want to stay here in Minnesota, that have contributed so generously, please hear their plea to make appropriate changes in tax policy so they can stay here, provide great jobs, opportunities for their next generation as well. Thank you, Senator Weger. And with that, we'll lay your bill over, Senate File 8, for possible inclusion in the Senate Tax Omnibus Bill. Thank you very much, Senator Weger. And members, we have, uh, we'll probably meet next. We won't meet tomorrow. We'll have some hearings next week lined up. So with that, we are adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.